By morning, about 80 Minutemen, local armed militia who were specially selected for being ready at a moment's notice, were waiting for the advancing British soldiers in the town of Lexington as a show of force. Although they really didn't plan to provide anything more than a hindrance to the British Army, because they recognized that they were so outnumbered, approximately 80 to around 1,000. And besides, they still considered themselves to be British. Independence was more than a year away. They were ordered to disperse, and in the confusion and noise, a shot rang out. No one knows who fired it, but it touched off a volley between both sides, at the end of which eight colonists lay dead. Once the commanders got their men under control, the dead disposed of, and relatives notified, the British army began to search the town. After several hours, they realized that both John Hancock and Samuel Adams had escaped. Although they likely had been there just hours earlier, they had searched individual houses. They had even searched the home of John Hancock's father, who was a local minister. Then the British Army decided to carry on towards Concord, their goal to carry out the other part of their mission. But the people of Concord and the militias there had been alerted to the British Army's advancement by Samuel Prescott. Paul Revere, who had made it to Lexington, had been captured. And the people in Concord were ready. At Concord, the British Army searched the town, but found little in the way of weapons and gunpowder, much of it already having been moved into hiding. They did decide, however, to burn what little they did find, and the fire got slightly out of control. Unbeknownst to the British Army, Hundreds of militiamen were occupying the high ground outside of Concord, and those militiamen incorrectly thought the whole town was being torched. So they hustled to Concord's North Bridge, which was being defended by a small contingent of British soldiers. The British fired first at the old North Bridge, but fell back when the colonists returned the volley. This was the shot heard around the world, later immortalized by poet Ralph Waldo Emerson. By the rude bridge that arched the flood, their flag to April's breeze unfurled. Here once the embattled farmers stood and fired the shot heard around the world. After searching Concord and the surrounding area for about four hours, the British Army prepared to return to Boston, located roughly 18 to 20 miles away. By that time, though, almost 2,000 militiamen had descended on the area, and more were constantly arriving. At first, these militiamen simply followed the British column, but fighting started again soon afterwards with the militiamen firing at the British army from behind trees, stone walls, houses, and outbuildings. Before long, British troops were abandoning weapons, clothing, and equipment in order to retreat even faster, and they faced these conflicts all the way back to Boston. Now, the colonists did not show particularly great marksmanship that day, but really that was kind of the nature of the weapons for the time period. There were as many as 3,500 militiamen firing constantly for around 18 miles, 
and over the whole course of that, they only killed or wounded approximately 250 Army regulars. They did lose about 90 of their own to death or wounds. Nevertheless, they proved that they could stand up to what was for the time one of the most powerful armies in the world. And news of the battle quickly spread, reaching London by the end of May. As the British retreated back to Boston, they were pursued by this militia, which began a siege of the city, trapping the army there. Critical to their continued ability to pin the British army into the city of Boston was the occupation of high ground around the city, particularly the hills on the Charlestown Peninsula to the north. Before the British army could get men into position, the colonial militias were able to occupy it and dig in, securing cannon on the top of Breed's Hill. The initial hope was that the colonies would occupy Bunker Hill, which was higher, but it was actually a little bit further from Boston. Once the army realized that the Americans were in a position of strength, the commander in Boston realized he had to take control of the position. So on June 17, 1775, the British Army launched an attack on Bunker Hill. And this would be the first true battle of the war. Because of their more forward position, Americans actually risked being surrounded and having their supplies limited. Which is exactly what happened. This would in turn force the colonists to hold their fire until they were sure of hitting what they were aiming at. Because, of course, guns of this time were notoriously inaccurate, often at best having a 10-yard range in terms of accuracy, though the bullets could fly much farther. The militias were able to hold their position for some time, inflicting heavy casualties on the British army, before ultimately they were forced to abandon their position because they were running short on gunpowder since their supply line had been cut off. Although the British army did eventually take control of both Bunker and Breed's Hill, which technically means they officially won the battle, it would be a very costly victory for the British army, who lost about half of their fighting strength due to both death as well as injuries. But for the Americans, this is somewhat of a success, a moral victory, if you will, because they were able to take on the most powerful army in the world, or one of the most powerful armies in the world, and they were able to do well. In response to what had happened at Lexington and Concord, in response to Britain's response to the First Continental Congress and the petitions that had been sent the fall, previous fall, this Second Continental Congress, as scheduled, began meeting in May of 1775 in Philadelphia again. From that point on, they continued to meet almost continuously until that Second Continental Congress was replaced by the brand new government of the United States under the Articles of Confederation in 1781. In effect, this Second Continental Congress would be the U.S.'s first government. The men who attended this Congress would manage the colonial war effort and would gradually adopt a position away from negotiation with Britain and towards independence. As the war was already underway, they decided to create a Continental Army out of the militia units that were already fighting and appointed George Washington, who had served in the British Army during the French and Indian War, to be the commanding officer in charge. 
The Second Continental Congress also issued a Declaration of Causes outlining the rationale and necessity for taking up arms, which would hopefully allow them to obtain assistance from other countries in Europe, since any country that they would have approached, whether it was the French, the Spanish, or the Dutch, they were all monarchies, and they certainly didn't want potential allies to think that they were throwing off rule by a monarchy because it was a monarchy. They were throwing off rule of a monarchy because that monarchy was a tyrant. In July of 1775, even after the Battle of Bunker Hill, this Second Continental Congress even made one final attempt at reconciliation with the king, sending him the Olive Branch Petition, but arrived in Britain too late to do any good. The Congress even authorized the creation of a navy and hired privateers to supplement their naval fleet. Men hired that would capture British shipping, which could then be sold and of course, the men involved would get to keep a significant portion of the profits, which of course encouraged them to capture more, the balance going to support the Continental Congress and the Army. Now, this Congress had no explicit legal authority to govern, but it assumed all the functions of a national government. They appointed ambassadors, they would sign treaties, they raised armies, they appointed generals, they even got loans from Europe and created paper money that were dubbed continentals and dispersed funds as needed. They had no authority to levy taxes and therefore were required to request money, supplies, and troops from the individual colonies, now often being called states, in order to support the war effort. Of course, these states frequently ignored those requests. By 1776, Congress was moving towards declaring independence from the British Empire. But many delegates lacked the authority from their home governments to take such drastic action. And not all of the people would have truly been supportive of such a decision, since most Americans were indifferent one way or the other, and really only about a third of them would truly have been considered rebels. And you still had a significant number of loyalists, estimated to be around 20% of the total population living in the colonies, many of them in the South. But, when the governor of Virginia, Lord Dunmore, fled, as he was clearly not in control of the government of his colony, he made an announcement that would soon change their outlook. Lord Dunmore announced that any slave who left his rebel master and joined the British cause could expect to receive freedom. And since many southern planters saw this as direct interference with their property rights, it would sway many who were previously undecided to join in on this rebel cause. Southerners had been the least likely to be rebels at this point, because of their fear that the trade of tobacco and other staple crops would be interrupted by a war. But as most of their wealth was tied up in their land and slaves, this was a significant threat to their way of life and their wealth. <laughs>